Well, what a wonderful planner. I hope you are all as eager to come to various aspects of the Mari Corelli centenary celebrations that will be going on fairly soon. Um, if you if you are, that would be wonderful. Um, there will be leaflets and all, um, what do you call it? <laughs> Got the word. Everything that you need to know is on the website. So just click on the website and it's there. Okay, I've just got a couple of things to say before we start. Um, if anybody wants to do anything with their family history, there are flyers around um, about some workshops that are going to be run by a member of the group um, in May, later in May. And if you don't want to do it online, if you let her know and there are enough of you or enough people who want to do it face to face, she will organize something face to face. Um, and also on the 20th, the day of the birthday parade, the Stratford Society isn't going to have a presence, but in the afternoon, three o'clock, Evesham Cemetery, there's going to be a small ceremony at Maria Crowley's grave. The mayor's going to be there, um, Nick's going to read a poem, and Kate Rolf, who is the mayor, is going to lay some flowers. That, that's on Sunday, 21st, on the Sunday calendar. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. right, I stand corrected. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like somebody knows. Sunday what's going the 21st, on. 3 o'clock. Right, yeah, Sunday the 21st, it, 3 o'clock. At the cemetery. At the cemetery, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, I think that's about it. So, Bob, who's been waiting patiently, thank you very much. I think you all know Bob Behrman. He's been around for... <laughs> Bob, Bob knows more about the building of Stratford than perhaps anybody else, and he's um, one of the driving forces behind the Stratford fire um, thing that's going on, where all the um, all the old buildings are being dated. Green dated, dendrochronology, if you want like big words, I prefer green dating. So, but, um, so yes, yeah, so Bob is um, going to tell us all about one of the first conservationists. She was a conservationist before anybody knew what that was, <laughs> and she did it here in Stratford. And Bob, please come and tell us, give us the benefit of all your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, yes, yes right. Yes, well, I apologize to, to start with in case I'm uh, teaching, I'm, I'm saying things that you all know about. But um, Mari Corelli, who uh, lived from 1855 to 1934 and was um, a legend in her lifetime having made something of a fortune as a novelist, when in 1899 she decided to settle in Stratford. She's always been well known to um, local audiences, of course, but over recent years, there's also been, um, there, there, there's also grown up a wider appre appreciation of her work. Indeed, so, several of her, her books have been reprinted, reflecting the fact that she now has quite a following. I have two confessions, though. Firstly, I've not read too many of her books, <laughs> but in my in in my defence, they are variable. <laughs> and secondly, I don't intend to say much this evening about her professional writing career. What I want to concentrate on uh, this evening is about her professional um, is about her uh, what what sorry, what what I want to concentrate on instead is, is what struck me some time ago that what um, characterised many of her activities in Stratford very much reflects the aims of the Stratford Society today, you know, pledged as, as we are, as one of our objectives, 
to protect the town's built heritage. He was someone over a hundred years earlier who was amongst those who took up the cudgels for such a cause. And her financial success as a writer made her fearless in expressions, expression of her views. And we'll see this got her into trouble with the people then running the town. They sought to make sure by various means that her eccentric, even bizarre behavior is how she would be remembered by posterity. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure she could be impossible at times, but all the same, what intrigued me was how she'd used her fame to make a stand for Stratford's heritage. And in doing so, had taken on the necessary task of confronting the establishment. Uh, this wasn't a, um, you know, the popular issue that it is today, or at least it wasn't with the people who were making decisions about the future development of Stratford. But she wasn't slow to challenge them when she thought they were making mistakes. And I will, of course, have something to say about her life and writings generally. It's what she sought to achieve as a conservationist, particularly in Stratford, that I intend to focus on. If you can, the first slide, Mark. Maureen Gray died at her home, Mason Cross, on the 21st of April, 1924. Now, Mason Court, of course, is the fine Georgian house in Church Street, now the home of the Shakespeare Institute, which bears a blue plaque and a stone set in the pavement to remind us still that this is where she lived for some 25 years. She'd come to Stratford aged about uh, 45 at the night of her uh, fame. And in some ways, I suppose, her residence in Stratford could be said to coincide with a comparative decline. And this is to some extent still reflected in her reputation amongst Stratfordians today. That is, as someone remembered for her eccentricities and not for her achievements. This was due largely to the fact that in her efforts to protect Stratford's heritage, she upset leading figures in the town by making sure that her views were taken up by the national press. <laughs> One tactic for them was to draw a veil over what she had achieved, focusing instead on such things as her importing a gondola. Um, can we have the next slide? Um, and an alleged gondolier on Venice to use on the Avon. Also her sentimental attachment to a pony and trap, which carried her about the town. Can we have the next slide? Now that's, <laughs> that's a, 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 um, a deliberately blank screen so I can uh, make sure the are all going to sleep. <laughs> but um, Murray's Ma 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 position as far as Stratford was concerned was a simple one. She loved the historic feel of the town and made it her personal mission to preserve this feel, if not to improve on it. And more to the point, to cry out against any attempts to despoil it. You can imagine that as a general philosophy, this didn't go down too well with the people charged with running the town. Firstly, Marie Carelli was accused of being a newcomer, even an outsider, a well-known ploy, of course, even today. <laughs> um, secondly, her criticism of development in the town could be taken as an attack on the town council, as indeed it quickly became. And thirdly, of course, she was a woman. And what's more, an ind independent woman alleged to hold subversive views. So her crusade to preserve the townscape and her scathing criticism of virtually all recent building work were not likely to find favor with the town's leaders. So the honeymoon was a brief one. Within four years after two lively controversies, Mari's quarrels with the leading townsmen had reached the libel courts. They didn't take <laughs> kindly to their town being pilloried in the, in the national press. Well, Mari, Mari, Mari was, was, as I say, an unusual phenomenon in late Victorian England, an, an independent woman. She was no feminist and had no time for the subjects at least at that point. But in, in her writings, she did say some uncomfortable things about the opposite sex. In a preface to her book, The Murder of, of Delicia, she wrote, there were any number of women who worked day and night to support useless and brainless husbands. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I allude principally to the upper ranks, where the lazy noodle spends his time first in idly accumulating debts and then looking about for a woman to pay them. <laughs> when man begins to understand that woman 
is not meant to be a toy or a drudge, but a comrade, then the clouds will clear and marriage will become a blessing instead of, as in too often, as is too often the case, a curse. <laughs> well, she was not the first to say this sort of thing, but not quite in such a populist way. She was, after, after all, addressing her comments to a generation that professed belief in the fundamental importance, if not the sanctity of marriage. But her constant harping in her novels on the theme of beautiful women trapped in, in loveless marriages, her insistence on the intellectual equality of man and woman, and her attacks on men for regarding women as somehow naturally inferior, all this raised considerable anxiety amongst the ruling male elites. <laughs> but, but their wives were also worried too. To the refined and wealthy Sarah Flower, her wife of Charles Flower, the Stratford Brewer, who would come back to, she was almost to be feared. In 1890, after reading Ardath, uh, Mari's fourth book, she wrote in her diary that she found it, found it a most disagreeable and disreputable book, which ought never to have been printed. Why are such bad books written? And why don't people protest against the evil they must do to young people especially? Anyway, we should hardly be surprised then that she ran into problems, made worse no doubt by her prejudice and vanities, but arising out of a deeper antipathy between her and those men who in their view deserve respect rather than outright, crit uh, out outright criticism. Can we have to have the next slide one? Mari Kelly, on first coming to Stratford in May 1899, took a lease of Holt's Croft in Old Town. Uh, this is how it looked in her day. Um, if we just go on the next slide, right. we can see we can see how it probably looked on your start today. She'd been ill for most of 1897, culminating in an off operation at the end of the year. A spell in the country was prescribed, so she settled on Stratford, where she had spent several happy weeks in 1890. By July, she was accepting public engagements, and by the end of the year, had established herself as a public benefactor and a patron of the arts. Mm -hmm. By October, everything seemed fine. Miss Corelli, de uh, declared the Stratford Herald, is a very busy and very unselfish lady. To a lady of her literary ability, time means money, and a day withdrawn from work represents a rather considerable sum. But Miss Corelli has shown that she is not a money-grubbing novelist. She is ready to assist both with her purse and her ability, any cause which needs her assistance or advocacy. So it was with great pleasure that the local newspaper was able to report on the 5th of October in 1900 that Mari had decided to make Stratford her home by purchasing Mason Croft. That's, that's how it looked in her day, or rather, but the time she died. And then just, just the next slide, Mari. And, and that's, of course, how it appears today. A, a lady who has done so much for the town in Thusia, who by her kindly act has made herself so justly popular, cannot well be spared. Mm -hmm. But in the next few weeks, there were developments which began to, which began to worry some people. Mm -hmm. Earlier in the year, Sir Theodore Martin, an elderly but well-respected lawyer, had obtained, had obtained permission to erect in the chancel of Holy Trinity Church a memorial to his late wife, the famous actress Helen Fawcett, who had died in 1988. Come in, next slide. Sorry, well, 1890s. 1890s. <laughs> the lady presented a pulpit to, to the church in her memory, which for various reasons had become a matter of controversy, mainly because one of the figures represented on it was thought to be his former wife, quite unsuitable in a church, some felt, because of her profession. Undeterred, Sir Theodore wanted to do something more. He proposed a memorial seven foot tall and three foot wide, and I think this is on the next slide. Um, seven foot tall and three foot wide to be placed on the wall of the chancel and crucially opposite um, Shakespeare's much smaller bust. <laughs> the feeling was, and many people today might still agree, that such a monument was over the top. And it is indeed extraordinary, given the controversy of the pulpit, that permission for it was ever obtained. On the 24th of October, only days after the Herald had given out the glad tidings of Mari's purchase of, of Mason Croft, she caused a storm 
by raising the issue of the proposed memorial in the national press. She alleged that there were thousands of people in Shakespeare's native town who most indignantly resent this intrusion into one of the most sacred of English shrines as an outrage. Next slide. The instant press coverage revealed her potential as a formidable champion. The London Examiner, Examiner the Whitehall Review, the Birmingham Daily Post, the Birmingham Gazette, the London Weekly Dispatch, to name, to name just a few. I'm not, in fact, I doubt whether there really were thousands of staff for you. Like said, <laughs> but the Herald remained supportive and Murray was able to introduce a whiff of conspiracy into the debate by suggesting that Sir Theodore may have bought permission to erect the memorial by offering to pay off a debt of 500 pounds on the church restoration fund. <laughs> Under strong attack was Sir Arthur Hodgson. Next slide. The squire of nearby Clopton House, a personal friend of Sir Theodore's. Mari, in an important interview with the Birmingham Daily Post, portrayed herself um, as the champion of the ordinary people of the town. She alleged that the only criticism against her was due to a sort of feudal system which prevails here. Sir Arthur Hodgson is in a position of authority and can sit on these people here. In, in a letter, she struck a similar note. My experience in Stratford's town showed me how tyrannically some of the wealthy dom dominate over their poorer brethren, who are more than their equal, in, equals in worth, if not in purse. Amongst these, she included the Flower family, who had done very well out of the brewery they had established in the town in 1830, revealing to the national press that Archie Flower had refused to sign her petition against the memorial scheme. This petition, headed by the Earl of Warwick, already had 500 signatures. To fan the flames, Murray had posters printed encouraging more to sign up. <laughs> after a fortnight of fierce debate, the unfortunate Sir Theodore gave in and on the 5th of November withdrew his proposal. Instead, he gave the memorial to the theatre, where it can still just about be seen if you know where to look. That's actually in the Swan Theatre. Um, oh, 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 nothing is over a staircase. Okay. So Mari had won her first battle in Stratford and rubbed her opponent's notice in it, in the most provoking way, by paying off the church debt herself. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mar Mari saw her victory as the triumph of the people over a small male oligarchy, who, if she'd not been there, would have got its way. There may have been an element of wishful thinking here, but the fact that her petition attracted over 500 signatures must have meant something. And a crusade against such establishment figures as Sir Arthur Hodgson was a novelty in itself. For it to have succeeded was remarkable, and for the successful campaign to have been run by a woman <laughs> was even more surprising. In any event, Mari's defeat of the scheme um, does a lot to explain subsequent events. Mari had successfully made the point that those who through their social position were in, were in the best position to defend the town in a wider context were, in her view at least, not to be trusted. Now, the um, Fawcett Memorial was not in fact the first local issue that Mari clearly had interested herself in. At the beginning of 1900, there was talk of filling in the old canal basin immediately in front of the theater on ground. Uh, can we have the next one? Uh, on the grounds that it posed danger to children and to the townsfolk's well-being generally, due to the offensive odour <laughs> arising at times from the stagnant water. As early as April 1900, Mari took up the job of defending the basin, which she claimed acted as a picturesque reflective mirror for the theatre building. Mm -hmm. I mean, looking at early views, um, she had a point, I think. The corporation pushed on with the scheme, creating in the process a far worse health hazard by allowing household refuse to be tipped into the next <laughs> as well as builders' debris. As the stench grew, so did public protest. <laughs> and in December 1900, the controversy reached the national press. Um, Mari, Mari, of course, had taken the lead in organizing another petition. Can we have the uh, next slide? <laughs> We, we, the undersigned, deeply regret that the ornama ornamental lake in the Bangkok Gardens is being filled up. This lake was, was formed and the grounds laid out 
through the generosity of friends at great expense, to unite with us in believing that the general appearance of the gardens will be greatly marred by the removal of this lake. Interestingly, as this um, predated the Fawcett Memorial for, for Rory later in the year, she was able to get um, signatures from members of the Flower family, who had largely funded the building of the theatre in the first place, as well as, uh, as Arthur Hodgson, with, with whom she was fallen out so spectacularly later in the year. Oh, just a quick point. Is this 1901? Yes. Uh, the, following, um, the, the following September, she fired off one of her typical letters to the Herald. The foolish, this is all a quote, the foolish intermeddling of persons who must be busybodies has completely spoiled the before charming expanse of, of river mead and water. And whatever small risk there used to be for children playing around the, around the pretty and safely shallow lake was nil compared to the present danger of an epidemic disease. Typhoid, scarlet fever, diphtheria and measles are all in the process of comfortably undisturbed germination in the stagnant mud, which is all improvers have left us at the mirror of the Memorial Theatre. And the poor little children who play about it are far more likely to be poisoned now than they're ever likely to be drowned. <laughs> she kept the issue before the general public by um, publishing um, uh, by, by publishing the uh, an account of the corporation's folly in her collection of essays, um, Chris, Christmas Greeting, published in November 1901. And talking ironically of the council's reluctance to spend any money, she went on, occasionally, however, in the goodness of their hearts, and misled by some intermeddler, they wasted. A notable example of this has been the unnecessary destruction of one of the prettiest bits in Stratford the sheet of water known as the Bancroft Basin. Somebody gifted with an overexcitable nose imagined that it emitted an undesirable perfume. This was not the case. It was only the nose that was at fault. <laughs> but since the unfortunate and innocent piece of water had been ruthlessly drained out and filled up, it has revenged itself by becoming a perfect, perfectly distillery of objectionable odors. The, um, the oversensitive nose she went on to explain, had belonged to an eminent local doctor, John, John James Nason, one of the supporters of the Helen um, Fawcett Memorial, uh, Memorial Scheme. And also, as Maya was going to point out, uh, the medical attendant on both Sir Arthur Hodgson and the Flower family. Mm -hmm. Earlier in the same essay, she had patronizingly summed up the town's governing body in the context of competing interest groups within the town. And, and, and this again is a, is a, is a, um, a quote. There are as many cliques in Stratford as there are in the army, and that is saying a great deal. There is the county clique, the church clique, the trustees of the birthplace clique, the memorial theatre clique, with which is subjoined, is subjoined the, the brewery clique, <laughs> the grammar school clique, and there are so many more dear little quaint little funny little sets all wanting to cut each other's throats <laughs> and forever getting their knives ready. And over them, over them all, serene, invincible, leisurely and bland, rides the corporation, fully conscious of its power and entirely aware that its long historical record makes it a very suitable object of respect indeed. It was in, it was in this same essay that um, Marie Corelli made her first general attack on what was happening to the general appearance of the town. All the, new build, all the new things built in Stratford, she declared, singling out the recent, uh, recently opened Lloyds Bank in Bridge Street. Can we have a couple of slides on that? That's how it, that's how it was built. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the next slide is, is how it looked before. Mm -hmm. are, in the worst, <laughs> are in the worst possible taste. The new street called Evesham Place is like a cheap bit of Clapham. <laughs> in the new houses on what is known as the Rolly Estate are built in the meretricious style of West Kensington art. Occasionally, in the town itself, the owner of a fascinating, mysterious oak rafted little shop pulls it down, beguiled by the jerry builder, and puts up a gaudy new plate glass concern like a suggestion of Edgware Road. Her view, still shared by many today, was that visitors to Stratford 
came with the expectation of finding a town which evoked the spirit of Shakespeare. <laughs> to permit development which ran contrary to this, might in her view, heal the goose that lays the golden egg. This is, this is an, another blank. <laughs> <laughs> there is no reason to suppose, though, that these views made her unpopular with ordinary folk um, by, uh, with, with, with um, the ordinary townsfolk. In January 1902, she delivered an important speech to the Stratford on Avon Pleasant Afternoon Society. <laughs> uh, today, the very name makes makes us smile, but in, in their days, in, in their day, PSAs were quite controversial. In fact, Marie Craig was publicly reprimanded for addressing one in 1899. Well, PSAs, challenged the Victorian assumption that Sunday was not a day on which to enjoy yourself. <laughs> but Mari had very little time for conventional religious observance. Her theme on this particular occasion was a sense of beauty. Now the, now the, local, news, uh, the local newspaper commented on the large attendance, only to be expected when such an eminent person was to, de was to deliver the address. There was also a popular drift of, of what she had to say. Beauty, she explained, resided in the natural world and was all around us, there for us all to enjoy. Beauty could not be bought. To cry to hear, hear, and with her statements received with applause, she said that rich people had many ugly things. She continued, I've been in the most gorgeously furnished houses and found them very ugly indeed. Indeed, I've found much prettier things in a stack of cotton than I had in many a big house in this town. Now, she then got on her hobby horse and slated the new brick building spinning up everywhere. <laughs> a view which the editor of the paper in a leader was able to support. She has seen a good deal in Stratford, which had doubtless outraged her sense of the beautiful. Miss Crelly does no harm and may do some good by hammering away at the hideous jerry built shanties which find an existence in picturesque Stratford. <laughs> so, he must have fallen into the trap, I think, of, of thinking that because her outspoken comments may have upset the town council and the local gentry, but she was generally unpopular. In March 1902, she attended a town football match wearing the club colours and received quite an ovation. <laughs> On her birthday in May, she received bouquets from the town's two primary schools. And for the following 12 months, the paper continued to report her speeches up and down the country, her house parties and her views on all sorts of things. I mean, no doubt, um, Marie Carelli and her friends had supplied much of the copy, but the point is that the newspapers printed them, securing the knowledge that these articles would go down well with their readers. In 1903, however, was to witness the fiercest of her stratford controversies, and despite her success, one from which her reputation wasn't really allowed to recover, it had become Mari's uh, per personal crusade to initiate a program for the restoration of Stratford's shooter buildings. If the half can we have next slide. If the half timbered houses down, oh, that's not my effect. Anyway, <laughs> uh, have you got one before? No. Oh, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, no, okay. Um, <coughs> If the half-timbered houses down the principal street were uncovered from their modern paint and stucco, she wrote in November 1901, it would be one of the most perfect old English thoroughfares in existence. She set the ball rolling in 1903 by contributing anonymously £200 to the restoration of the Tudor house on the corner of High Street and Ely Street, now a Thai restaurant, the Giggling Squid. Mm -hmm. Here we see it before, um, before the work, here the work in progress. <laughs> and, then, and then how how it looked after the um after the work and finally how, how it looks today. So you can imagine her in indignation when she discovered late in 1902 that the town council and the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust were jointly planning the extensive demolition of buildings in Henley Street on the back of a scheme to build a public library. Even worse, this was to be mainly funded by the American 
or so um, the, 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 the American millionaire Andrew Carnegie. In fact, he was Scottish by birth, but by then was largely resident in, in, in the US. He first, or so she claimed, tried private persuasion on the retiring mayor, Archie Flower. And in February 1903, when it at last became clear that five cottages adjoining the uh, adjoining the, the Shakespeare birthplace, uh, the Shakespeare's garden, um, were to be demolished. And then she eventually broke her silence on what I considered a national scandal. Her letter in the Morning Post took, at least by her standards, a moderate line. <laughs> I know I am only expressing a very general and deeply felt opinion in England that when there are so few old world, old world towns remaining unspoiled in England, the birthplace of Shakespeare should at least be guarded more sacredly for the nation than that a portion of its most historic street should be left open to the easy purchase of the mere millionaire by a pretty debate of money people. Mari's letter immediately made the issue a national one, and a fierce controversy arose. Archie Flower immediately wrote to the Daily Post, claiming that the houses in question were not old at all, and would therefore be no loss to the town. But this turned out, in fact, to be untrue. Only two in the row turned out to be quite modern. Next slide. Only, only two in the row turned out to be quite modern. I, that, that's by um, uh, early 19th century and were demolished without any objection. But the others on either side, owned by the Birthplace Trust and the Town Council, um, respectively, had well preserved timber frames of Elizabethan or earlier dates hidden behind brick facades. We've got the next one. When in May this became public knowledge, things had gone too far for an amicable settlement. But Mari had been forthright in her criticisms of the town council and the birthplace trustees. The proprietor of the local newspaper, George Boyden, was a birthplace trustee and so gave the issue only token coverage in the Herald. Mm. But the regional and national, new the national newspapers more than made up for this. One of her most hard-hitting pieces appeared in the spring issue of King and Country where she went through the names of the town council and birthplace trustees mm. and concluded there was scarce one of them to whom the custody of the Tetan cottages could be entrusted. <laughs> she even went so far as to, as to suggest that the theatre, built largely out of flower money, was a tie house. <laughs> so that's that's true. Quote, just one of the sarcastic names applied to it by the wicked wits of the neighbourhood. <laughs> the upshot of all this was that in May the cottages were in effect saved. The Birthplace Trust announced, for the time being at least, that nothing would be done to the two timber frame cottages on their land, which are on the left of the picture. And the corporation, that the future abandoned its library scheme, agreed to restore the structure on site rather than replace it. Even though this meant the sort of restoration work, uh, which involved reducing the original building to its timber frame. I think I've got one. Oh, that's the um, that's the shop, the yeah. shop, which is key to my friend. Um, the next one, yeah, there, there we are. They they have they have to strip they have to strip the building down to its um its to its original timber frame in order to do the restoration work. Now, now the opposition she managed to coordinate was formidable. Uh, again, we've got a slide. I hope. Um, she, the, the um, amongst amongst the people who objected were the Selborne Society, the British Archaeological Society, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, the London and Middlesex Archaeological Society, the London Shakespeare League, the White Fri White Friars Club, and a list of people calling themselves independent members of the literary and artistic professions. Mm. Murray even persuaded Ed Edward Elgar, who, who, who was living in in um, Alveston, to sign. Um, we've got no what's wrong with that. No, sorry, in the next one. He's third from top. All these bodies had, of course, been alerted by Mari, and their support for her cause is a measure of the pressure she could bring to bear. 
in October, the Birthplace Trust finally agreed to retain the two cottages on their part of the site after, after debating a motion lost by two votes that they be raised to the ground. <laughs> One trustee in favour of such action was our old adversary, John James Nason, another Sir Theodore Martin, both still smarting for Marie Crenny's victory over the proposed mm -hmm. memorial to Henry Fawcett. So major concessions had been won. The, the library duly opened, oh, next slide please. The, the, the library um, duly opened. Um, and if Mari had cared for her posthumous reputation, she could have left matters there. But she refused to back off, mainly because the issue had become highly personalized as a result of a lampoon printed around the time of Shakespeare's birthday. The background to this is that Mari had published for the birthday itself a manual she called the Avon Star, largely written by herself. One of the articles entitled The Spoliation of Henley Street printed much of the press coverage of the issue, which until then had been vigorous, but generally impersonal. But shortly, shortly afterwards appeared the lampoon entitled The Errors of the, of the Avon Star. Uh, this was an anonymous, but written by, by Harvey Bloom. It, pit, it picked numerous pedantic holes in Marie Crelly's manual, mocking her education, hinting at her illegitimate birth, and generally making her a figure of fun. Her reaction, of course, was to become personal too. And it was from the publication of, of this lampoon that her attacks on individuals began, including the mayor, Archie Flower. In May, she delivered these words to the OP club in, in London. We have heard of big trusts, trusts that spring up in the night, like mushrooms to wither in the morning, trusts that are spun like gossamer and are dispersed with the first uh, adverse wind, Trusts like unsuspected quicksands absorbing men's lives and fortunes into oblivion. Trusts that may be for all we know as solid as rocks. But the most curious trust anybody has ever heard of is surely the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, <laughs> which by Act of Parliament in 1891 is stated to be on behalf of the nation, but which has now become entirely involved in, in a brewery company. Nothing can be suggested, resolved or carried out that takes this birthplace without the authority of the principles of the brewery. All the custodians, committees or libraries are under the same government, absolutely. The nation is represented there, not in the form of consideration and respect for the poetic term, but for the prosaic uh, beer barrel. <laughs> there, there was more in similar vein, and she also commenced proceedings in the High Court against the Birthplace Trust for dereliction of duty. In an effort to stop um, such attacks, Archie Flower persuades a recently appointed life trustee, Sidney Lee, to produce a pamphlet, uh, next slide, the then evangelism at Stratford on, Stratford on Avon. Mar Marley rejoined with an equally good, if not a better one, um, <laughs> the, the plain truth <laughs> of the Stratford on Avon controversy. She also had the last laugh. Um, as Stratford booksellers were reluctant to stop these pamphlets, which is which in, 19, in 1906, Archie Flower dumped in the library when Marley found out it was being sold to the public for as little, little as a penny um, copy instead of the cover price of one shilling, the Flower family again found itself targeted in, in the national press. Now, her one mistake was to begin a libel suit against, um, against Ed Winter for a letter which had appeared in the Stratford Herald in June. This um, alleged that the real motive for Marie Credit's crusade was spite. A year or two previously, um, it was claimed, Marie Corelli herself made inquiries about buying the, the site on which the part of the library was to stand, but had adapted gibbed at the price. So what she was really complaining about was, was that Carnegie and the Clough family and the Flower family were getting the glory which should have been hers. Now, Mari was not prepared to let Winter get away with the sniping <clears throat> and began, began libel proceedings. The case came on in December and the jury nominally found in her favour. The jury also made, it, made its views known in awarding her the famous farthing damages. Mari, Mari, Mari could have easily have afforded 
to ignore Windows remark. Instead, she decided to make an issue of it and was shown up in the national press as petty. So ended the liveliest controversy in which Mario Craig was involved. Viewing the matter dispassionately, um, we must concede, I think, that even if she were not right, which I think she was, then at least she had a good case. It's also true that if she had not intervened, then important buildings would have been lost. But the Stratford Worthies didn't see it like this. They did not take kindly to reading in punch. And to um, appreciate their joke, you need to be aware of the title of one of her most popular books, The Sorrows of Satan, and to remember oh. that she kept a gondola on the neighbor. <clears throat> there was a fair siren of Strat, that's not occurring here, of course, who narrated the sorrows of Sat. <clears throat> She'd gone on the A, she was everyone's fave, though she used Shakespeare's trustees as a mat. <laughs> Oh, no, we don't know. We don't know what the ordinary townsfolk made of all this, but what is certain is that Mary Crelly lost the goodwill of those with real influence in the town. Their response was the handing down of stories of her affectations, vanity, and alleged hysterical behaviour. Hysterical behaviour. These have passed into local folklore, and are what we are still fed with. Her achievements in preserving some of the town's fabric are largely forgotten. Of course, Marie Corelli was not bothered that she was now completely out of favour. She carried on with her attacks on the town council for several more years. In 1989, she was still saying things like, I love, I love the actual townsfolk, and I can see how much more prosperous they might be if they were not sat upon by an imperious little oligarchy. <laughs> and as she had easy access to magazines and newspapers, flowers still found themselves appearing in the national press in none too respectful terms. It is hardly surprising, actually, as um, Archie, in this course of evidence he gave at the libel trial, had admitted that he would have paid a thousand pounds to get her out of Stratford. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George Boyd, the editor of the Herald, she had long ago since dumped. Following an editorial in March 1902 mm -hmm. to the effect that the campaign against the library development uh, was being run by outsiders, she wrote to him, I shall, I shall neither speak to you again nor acknowledge your presence in any way. <laughs> <laughs> but it may be that she learned something from her confirmation, from her confrontations. Her next enterprise was carried out more constructively. At the end of June 1905, Harvard House in High Street came on the, came on the market. Architecturally speaking, it was probably the finest in Elizabethan house in Stratford, mm -hmm. with the added interest of having been the home of the mother of John Harvard, mm -hmm. the founder of Harvard University in America. During the library controversy, of course, Mark Murray Carelli had invaded against, invaded against all things American. Um, I consider, yeah, next slide. I consider, oh, there ought to be one before that. No? Okay, well, um, well uh, this, was actually, uh, uh, this was an uh, attack on Carnegie. Um, I consider, she said, that a man who ordered, ordered out Pinkerton's police force, um, as Carnegie has done, to fire on his workmen when they were on strike, has no right to be associated, even in the remotest degree, with the street where our greatest poet was born. The, the, uh, the fountain in, in the robber market Next slide, unveiled in 1887 as a gift from America, she described as the of, of, as of the ugliest possible small <laughs> design and make. It looks as if it had been hewn out in a fit of dull, in a fit of dull abstraction by a man of the stone period. <laughs> and as recently as January 1905, she declared that she would not visit America until the press is conducted by a gentleman. <laughs> However, this didn't prevent her later the same year. From persuading Edward Morris, um, son of a millionaire meatpacker from Chicago, to buy Harvard House as a clubhouse for American visitors in Stratford. She had met Morris in the summer of 1905 whilst cruising on Grocer Thomas Lipton's yacht and got sufficient assurances out of him by the end of July for the purchase to go ahead. Here, here she's on the right, you can just see her wearing white. Um, um, and um, with um, Ed Edward Morris on the left. The deal was finalised in December and a programme of restoration drawn up. 
I mean, this may all, this may all seem rather two-faced. On the one hand, we have Marie Curie insulting Americans. In 1903, she stated that Americans were, for the most part, ill-mannered and illiterate, and singularly uninteresting in their conversation. But on the other hand, she was wheedling out of one of them, a very considerable sum of money. But she was unlikely to have persuaded an English son to the, uh, the, building's re um, the building's rescue. In any case, she had no intention of seeking help close to home. When trustees came to be appointed to run Harvard House, she was adamant um, that nobody from the town council or the birthplace trust should be included. In fact, the arrangements for the official opening uh, four years later, you know, in October 1909, were a deliberate snub to the dignitaries of the town. She achieved the very real, the very real success. Can we have the next one? Um, she achieved the very real success of, of getting the American ambassador to perform the ceremony. A specially chartered train brought him and other distinguished guests from London to Stratford, where he was greeted by Mari Corelli. He, he, he was then whisked off to Harvard House for the opening ceremony and then to Mason Croft for luncheon. She could not get away with not inviting the mayor, but he played no part in the proceedings. And at the luncheon, didn't even make it onto the top table. <laughs> and no, no other Stratford person was asked to make a speech, give a vote of thanks, or even propose a toast. In fact, none, with the exclusion of the vicar and the mayor, appears to have been even invited. Now, we may think Mario is being petty, perhaps he was, but to the world at large, she was portrayed as the enthusiastic defender of Stratford's precious buildings. The restoration of Harvard House was Mario Keller's last uh, major effort in the field of conservation, or, 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 um, or preservation, as she would unashamedly have called it. Still, in 1910, she purchased the first garden. Oh, today. Uh, 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 right, uh, next, ne next, next slide. Anyway. Okay. She purchased the first garden in, in Mother Street, which is still there next to the police station, with the sole desire of preserving this beauty spot in the hands of builders and preventing the destruction of the fine old trees that are enclosed there. And in the spring of 1913, she was the major speaker at the launch of the Guild of the Guild of Stratford on Avon, a body belatedly set up to protect the town's heritage. The fact that she was invited to such a meeting, albeit 10 years after the library controversy, is a, is a sure indication that her views on Stratford had at least been shared by some local people. She could not help reminding her audience of the, uh, of, of, of the battle she fought. I would only hope that the good citizens of Stratford would realise fully the importance of the stand we are making we are seeking to make against the destruction of the town's old world reputation and beauty. Stratford must remain in history as unique in itself. We do not want to de degenerate into a mere suburb of Birmingham, um, to which there was applause. <laughs> <laughs> to her indignation, she discovered soon afterwards that meetings of the Guild were being held without her knowledge. She wrote to the secretary, I hear there is to be a meeting of the Guild tomorrow. I have not been asked. <laughs> I should like to know if I'm to be if I'm to be deliberately left out of these things. If so, I should withdraw my name entirely. Now the secretary, um, Fred Wellstood, persuaded her that being a vice president, she need not attend their committee meetings. And for a while she remained a committee supporter, firing, firing off efforts from time to time, asking, for instance, what the guild was doing about the demolition of some cottages in Waterside. It was, a, it was far sighted on her part to recognize the value of humble buildings of this sort and the contribution they could make to the town's appearance, even at a time when they faced not onto gardens as they do today, but on a derelict canal basin. But they were destined to go to make way for um, a garage and now for this. Yeah. <laughs> Her last contribution to the Guild's work was to make the largest single donation for the restoration of number 30 High Street. Next slide. This was a particularly um, difficult thing for her to do. 
as, to the, as the property by then was owned by Fred Winter, against who she bought the infamous Loudon Nigel case 10, um, 10 years earlier. At first, she promised a donation, only on condition that Winter would admit that she was paying a lion's share and that he wished to be represented in the local press as many consenting to help Mr. Winter. But she confided, she confided to a friend involved in the project. I do not suppose, I do, I do not suppose Mr. Mr. Boyden will put it in. That's put it in the Herald, as he invariably distorts every state statement made about me. But I shall expect you to insist on the thing being properly worded, considering the very exceptional circumstances under which I'm doing the town this service after the libelous concoctions of Sidney Lee, Flower, Boyden, and Winter in connection with my saving the Shakespeare property in Henry Street. The press release eventually read, in the present instance, the Guild is indebted to the generosity of Miss Mari Corelli, one of its vice presidents, for the largest share of the cost in, in, in this um, in, 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 in this restoration. Go ahead, the next slide. Yeah. Um, well, some, some people clearly come to regard Mari Corelli as impossible. <laughs> and there can be no doubt that she could be both passionately outspoken and unpredictable. But it's by no means a certain that her unpopularity with her straps of critics was entirely to do with her character. It may instead have been rooted in her saying out loud what her critics did, did not want to hear, or rather what they did not wish to be a matter of public debate. <clears throat> we might be tempted to believe that she could have realised her aims by more seemly and reasoned debate. Experience shows, though, that this might well be wishful thinking. Constructive discussion is usually a euphemism, the, the keeping objectors quiet by making them feel involved. Often more effective is the threat of public exposure. And this, of course, would only work if there's something to expose and if the press would be persuaded the story is a good one. Maureen Corelli, because of her immense mass appeal, could usually rely on her public statements being taken up. And whenever they were, it was found that she had a case. So she's able to force the debate when otherwise there wouldn't have been one. Now, now looking back at the more recent past, I recall um, agonised letters in the local paper bemoaning the destruction of the town and even asking why the Stratford Society wasn't doing anything about it. Well, it's not always easy to do this when you know that in the process you are likely to make local enemies. Now, with Mario Grelli, she just didn't care. Financially, at least, she was an independent force. And in terms of her posthumous reputation, she may have paid the price for her disregard of local sensibilities, or at least the sensibilities of those who determined to have the last word. We would think from the stories about her which still circulate in the town that she was just a vain and eccentric old woman. In fact, despite her faults, I still like to see her as a pioneer in the movement to protect the Stratford's built heritage from the ravages of open, open, open development and someone who deserves, if not the affection, at least the respect of all those um, like our society who have since labored in the same field. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, uh, um... I, uh, when I first came to Stratford, I lived in lodgings in Chestnut Walk with a lady called Miss Giggs, a very formidable lady who was already in her late ages then. And she'd known Mari Corelli quite well. And uh, she lived just in Chestnut Walk, which of course is just close to, yeah. to Mason Croft. Uh, she was very acerbic about Mari Corelli, <laughs> who, of course, was, known, was born as Minnie Mackay. I really yeah. was Minnie Mackay. Yeah. She was trained as a concert pianist in her early years before she came to Stratford. Uh, Miss Gibbs would tell rather uh, malicious stories about how uh, when Mari uh, got into her, cha her carriage, along with her companion, as we say nowadays, Bertha Biver was a large lady, the uh, the carriage would go down on the left hand side <laughs> because Minnie was a rather large lady. Yes. Uh, and also she would tell a story about how on Shakespeare's birthday, 
when Mary uh, was refused to join the procession to Sheikh's grave, but went down to the, to the church by herself late in the afternoon, bearing a bunch of flowers inscribed from she who understands. So, <laughs> and then I came to live in the midst of crop myself for a number of years. There was one day when I, was, I, I heard there was a knock on the door on a, on a Sunday morning, and the lady who was at the door, she said she had been a nurse to Mari Kirby in the early days. Could she show around the building? I said, yes, but only. So I showed her around. And she said, do you have any of her books? Have you read any of her books? I said, yes, I read a couple. She said, yes, they are rather deep. Um, <laughs> so I felt probably put it into my place. <laughs> but she, she, there is, of course, as, as I'm sure Bob knows, uh, an interesting biography of her by Brian Masters, which uh, tells the story of her efforts in Stratford. And she was an important figure in the conservation of Stratford, as Bob has quite rightly stressed. <laughs> the biography um, that you were talking about um, by um, by Masters was, yeah. was actually uh, called Now Brabham's Rule Was a Rotter. Yes. Yeah, and, and that did actually set out to un undermine her reputation quite yes. um, yeah. considerably. In fact, there 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 is a more recent um, biography. Um, oh, really? Yeah, by um, Theresa Ransom. By by Theresa Ransom, called called know. called the mysterious Mary Curie, which, oh, is, which is which is a much better um, sort of, uh, a much more balanced account of uh, of her time in Stratford. Mm -hmm. Well, particularly. Yeah, sorry. Bob, oh, could could you just um, enlighten us a bit more about the, the stories to do with the various gondolas and the gondoliers <laughs> she had? Well, I think Nick Nick's probably the person who could because <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got the gondola, haven't you? Yeah. Right. Um, the gondola actually, contrary to um, what's what, what is said in a lot of the brokers, actually didn't she didn't order from Venice. It was built for an Italian fair at, um, in London in 1904 by a gondola builders called Casal. And they um, and it was sold after the fair at auction. And Mary Torelli uh, went down and bought it because she thought it would be picturesque on the river. She genuinely loved boating. She did have a punt on the river before she bought the gondola. And she used to keep them both down at Davis's boat hire um, just by the ferry. And Annie Davis. The old man Davis's daughter was her secretary, of course, who also part-timed at the technical school next to the library. But um, the gondola came up from London with a gondolier who probably came from Venice, who was a genuine Venetian, who'd come up for the fair and got brought, brought up here. Um, and he used to lodge in Old Town um, and got soon got bored. He used to drink with the colleagues from the boat club in, um, in the Dirty Duck. And apparently got into a, a fracas with someone and pulled a knife and Mary Curley immediately dismissed him. Mm. And Ernest Chandler, a gardener, became the gondolier uh, fairly soon afterwards. Sadly, he was killed in the First World War at Arras and uh, she never used the gondola after that. But before that, in 1910, um, she struck a medal for the first English gondolier which is still in possession of um, his descendants, uh, which is a charming little little bit. I mean, she genuinely did love the boat. But anyway, that's that's the story. And we actually did find the original order for the boat in the Venetian State Archives. My colleagues in Venice, we know it costs 1,400 lira, and it was one of 15 gondolas that, that were ordered and take to London, but this one was a deluxe gondola. It's not called Sutton. It's not called Sutton. It's, sorry, yes, that's the other. Thank you, Lindsay. It's extremely un unusual because gondolas are normally 11 metres long, just under 11 metres, but this one is just over eight metres long. It's a two-third size gondola. It's, it's, it's absolutely unique now, and the Venetians are fascinated by it because when I told them, oh, we've got a, you know, eight metre long gondola, they said, that's silly. <laughs> so it's the only one in existence. So it's, it's very, very rare than that being you. I and mean, we have its historical precedents and its um, you know its origins going right back to 1904. 
And you're displaying it, aren't you? We're hoping that it might make an appearance on Sunday in the mayor's parking space outside the town hall. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We're going to try and get it a parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Nick. <laughs> Very detailed account, <laughs> much better than I could have done. Yeah. Regarding biography, there are some splendid anecdotes about uh, Marie Corelli in Ursula Bloom's book. Yeah, um, is it Rosemary for Remembrance? Um, I think it's something, it's, something it's, about it's an extraordinary. Or, um, and of course, she's or the, the she was the daughter of Harvey Bloom, yeah. who yeah. who wrote the Lampoon. Yeah, but um, I mean, one has to take what she says with a pinch of salt, I think, because she fed up, she fed up uh, disastrously with, with the family, um, because her daughter, allegedly, um, Ursula, had, had been invited around to tea by, uh, by, by Mike, Mike Early, and she and the child asked, um, are you a divorced woman? And that, of course, would have been impossible. For, well, she couldn't afford to. Um, um, well, the very fact that people were talking about her in the town as divorced um, would have been um, um, too much for her to bear. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any questions? No? That's wonderful. Thank you, Bob. That was, um, I'm sure that everybody here who thinks they know everything there is to know about Mario Drake, including yourself, uh, always finds something else that you hadn't come across before, they hadn't heard before, because she's one of those women that you can never entirely get to grips with, you can never yeah. find, you really entirely find out everything there is to know about her one day, maybe, um, when they have the centenary of her birth. Which unfortunately we can wait for. <laughs> um, so, but uh, yeah, she's endlessly fascinating, and I hope you'll all attain at least some part of the Corelli Centenary, uh, either at Harvard House and on Town Hall. And um, there will be, oh, but if you go on the Stuff Society website, you can find out all about it. Kevin? I, I would like to just make a comment, if I might, somewhat controversial. Um, one does wonder, given what is happening to Harvard House, if she wasn't quite forward thinking in not wanting it to be placed under their care. Because the building is sitting there without any real use, albeit having been intended as a, from what I hear, a, a club, a country club for visiting Americans. And maybe there is a need to learn but if you're going to attract uh, contributions uh, in terms of the modern society to keep things going, you've got to do something to make that happen. Yeah. And the current uh, uh, the use of the building is really pretty pitiful. Yeah. But and the but, for schools. Um, but but the irony the 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 irony of that, um, Kevin, is that the. Um, it is now owned by Harvard, by Harvard University, yes. and but they yes. and they won't contribute anything. Yes, and it is and it is actually in the in the birthplace trusts. Um, they they hold it on on a they do um, a petrol rent. They do. So it's come back in into their possession. They do, but there have been some uh, in the last few years suggestions of alternate development use. And it doesn't feature quite understandably at all, very importantly, where the problems that the birthplace has got in other things. And it does seem to have been, um, in, a sh in a sense, uh, not a priority. Put it put that way. May I respond? <laughs> uh, to, say, to say that the Birthplace Trust, as we know, does not own Harvard House. I know. It's owned by Harvard University. The Birthplace Trust has a lease on it, which I think has about, maybe it's under 20 years to go. Yes. I might remind the Stratford Society that in 2016, when New Place was closed for a while for redevelopment, it was Harvard House 
the Birthplace Trust opened very extensively and beautifully as an alternative visitor destination for people from around the world to um, enjoy while the site new place was closed. So um, at the moment, the house is used a lot for education groups, not just school groups. It's used for undergraduate groups from around the world. So in fact, hundreds of people have um, been to Harvard House to use it in the last two and a half years. I've spoken there uh, on, on, on myself on occasion many times. Um, and it's, it is the fact, and Bob will recall this, that Harvard University have blocked suggestions, perfectly good ones by the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, in my view, to develop Harvard House and to um, open it up more. And one of the problems is we, we are not allowed to put a lift into it. Harvard University will not allow us. So work that one out mm -hmm. in these days of access and demands mm -hmm. and equality. So in fact, it's, um, it's a very mixed blessing and the Birthplace Trust is doing all it can to utilize it while it still owns the lease. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think that's anything to do to do, to do with Mario Premier, though. Oh, no, I well, mean, it's everything to do with Mario Premier well, in the sense that she said it in the first place. Yes, but, and we thank her for saying it in the first place. I mean, one of the lovely things about your paper, Bob, and I'm sure I was not alone in the room, I think we're all kind of rooting for Mari every time, <laughs> everything we heard about her. The more I hear about her, the more I like her. Yes. I mean, truly. And we are it. We are the spirit of Mari Carelli now in Stratford upon Avon. We want to do what she was doing. Um, but I had to respond to Kevin because I think not enough is known actually about the Birthplace Trust's use of Harvard House. Thank you. Robert, on that spirit thought. Please join us on Sunday at three o'clock <laughs> in the cemetery for the hundredth mm -hmm. anniversary of her day. And there we will be laying flowers on the grave. That's a beautiful thing to be doing. Thank you, Stratford. In fact, I, I, I think I am due, due to be um, needing a walk on Monday. Yes, yes. Well, as part on the of Monday. Part. On the Monday. Right, yeah. Um, today, round, 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 It'll be um, down to Bob to do it with a flush. <laughs> 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 the idea of models. Yes. Oh, we can't have it. Well, I, I, I sort of read a few. Um, you know, but they are they are variable, and they're, they're not sort of um, um, page page turners, are they? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. May, may I just uh, just make a bid for for those who are here on the Sunday? Um, we're having a talk in the morning about Mary Corelli, a general, more general one about her life. And at yeah, lunchtime, we are hoping to have a recital of music that she wrote. It's going to be here for over a hundred years. That's on May the. That's on. This is on Sunday, May the fifth, uh, the bank holiday weekend. So that's still subject to um, to confirmation because a uh, very well known local pianist and uh, and um, a, a colleague are, are getting getting organised to play music at all short notice. So the academics are dragged out of archives all over the world so it should be rough fun and then in the afternoon for those who don't have uh, experience or read any of her books we're having a dramatized reading of perhaps one of the most famous novels the sorrows of satan which bob mentioned uh, which will be two hours long or two and a half with an interval with um eight people eight local actors uh taking all the parts so it will be read to an audience in the town hall um it's a great Novel with fantastic rip roaring <laughs> plots, <laughs> yeah, a Faustian tale wrapped up with a love story, partly set in in and around Stratford because the hero buys uh, a house which we can identify as Charlton Park, 
And the heroine, or sorry, one of the supporting characters, a woman called Mavis Clare, MC, uh, <laughs> a writer whose books are planned by the critics but loved by the public, <laughs> lives in a little cottage in the village of Bishop's Hampton, next to Willow's near Court, which is called St. Hampton Lucy, which Mary Perrone must have got inspiration from when she was here in 1890. So her book was written in, in uh, 1895. Uh, and it was the first true blockbuster best-selling novel, as we understand it, um, and sold in the hundreds of thousands. Anyway, so it should be fun. Uh, so uh, uh, you can go online, you go onto the Society website, and uh, ship it to free, and register for a ticket on Sunday. Yeah. Thanks, Jan. Um, thank you. And so the song was made into a film later. Um, starring that well known actor Adolf Mongeau, who was, uh, who was well known by then. <laughs> um, but yes, it was, um, <laughs> it was a, I think it was, well, I don't know about Hollywood but us. Blockbuster, but it certainly made a stir when it came out in the cinemas. Anyway, has um, anybody got anything else to ask of while we while we've got in? Yes. Go on. I don't know whether I'm misremembering, but some time ago, um, the gondola was at a Compton Burning. And I was told it was Marie Corelli's gondola. Yeah. I wonder if I, if I imagined it. No, I, I think the the, uh, the, yes, the the official historian of the gondola is <laughs> <laughs> nodding. So it, yeah, he was. Yeah, we got asked to take it there and put it on the lake. Yeah, and oh, well, rode, rode up under one of the most beautiful bridges in the county. Still, we're still talking about her. <laughs> she loved that. Bless her. <laughs> Okay. Well, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was okay. great. Yeah. Thank you all for coming and don't forget to look out for the flyers and the posters, all for the new centre and new celebration. And I hope to see you lots of new things and so be late. Thank you.